This episode of Egalia Chats is brought to you by Egalia and our brand new Servo Collective, a community funding drive to support development of Servo, the only web engine to be written in a memory-safe programming language with modularity, embeddability, and parallel computing in mind. Visit servo.org to learn more and opencollective.com slash servo to lend your support. Okay, hi, welcome to Egalia Chats. Uh, I am Brian Cardell. I am a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, today we have two guests. Hi, I'm Luke. I'm a web platform engineer at Egalia. Hi, I'm Simon. Uh, I'm a standards engineer at Mozilla. Today on the show, we're going to talk about um, getting started in standards. Everybody here is uh, somehow involved in standards, and maybe we took even different paths to it. At least one of us has helped write a, a guide to help other people get involved, which is pretty nice. We'll talk about. So yeah, let me just ask, like, um, I think two people have worked for browsers. So Eric, you used to work for Netscape back in the day, right? Oh, a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, like 2001 to 2003. And um, Simon, you worked, you work for Mozilla now, but you worked for Opera back in the day, right? Yeah, that's correct. I started at Opera in 2007. Uh, that was my first job, really. And I worked there for 10 years. Yeah. And then after that, I worked five years at Buku, which is a consulting company. Uh, and I'm a, now I'm at uh, Mozilla. Yeah. You and Eric both sort of got your start in standards through writing tests, right? Um, yeah, writing tests was, I think, my entry. Although I started to contribute to standards at the same time, basically. I joined the Wattwig mailing list in 2005, which was two years prior working at Opera, uh, and made various proposals or pointing out bugs in the spec. Was it the pointing out bugs in the spec that led you to start writing the tests? Or was it the test that helped you find the bugs? I'm just curious. Probably a bit of both. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I asked because when I started out, you know, I, I started writing CSS tests because I kept... Okay, so this is a long time ago. <laughs> it's when CSS was first starting to ship. And I kept trying to... Like I would take things from the specification and try them in browsers and they wouldn't always work the way I thought it would, or maybe it would work in one browser the way I thought it would not the other. So I started writing tests to say sort of very basic case tests to say, you know, is this actually working the way it's supposed to in browsers? And that's actually how I started uh, reporting bugs um, was because I, yeah. in some cases ran into bugs, but in some cases w was running into my own lack of understanding of, of the standard at the time. So Simon, do you have any, uh, like, do you do any implementation work? Uh, not really. Uh, I made my, I, I think I've done two patches to Gecko uh, in my life, in my life. Uh, and they both were with the user agent style sheets related. So it's no C++. Um, mm. almost, um, the, yeah, the most... I think that makes Luke unique among us <laughs> because <laughs> Luke does the implementation work as well. Um, yeah. Luke, do you want to talk about how you got involved? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of interesting. You talk about the tests because I come from a, I, I come from the web application development background. So the thing that got me into standards was more trying to do something in, a, in an actual application, finding edge cases that maybe didn't behave how I expected or didn't behave consistently. And then kind of went through MDN, um, which is kind of the, the entry point into the web for most web developers and finding either the data there is wrong or the data have notes that explain the issue. Um, and MDN articles have really useful links out to specs. So that was kind of the next next progression there was to jump to the specs and often I'd read the spec and it would make perfect sense or I'd read it and go okay I don't understand this um, and to start with part of it was kind of 
learning how to read the specs. And part of it was just having the belief of, oh, no, I think I understand this, but I think the spec is wrong here sort of thing. And then raising issues uh, and browser bugs from there. So lots of what I did originally was just loading up JS Fiddle and basically writing a web platform test inside of that, which then made getting to the actual writing test bit quite a bit easier. But because of that, because of my past is development, I guess that kind of led me down the implementation path um, more so than the spec path. But Luke, did you have like C++ or C experience or like? No, I didn't. How, how did you manage getting into that? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, Yeah. So I'd done, um, so I learned to code in Java at the same time as Visual Basic and, and Java, which were obviously quite different to C++, but there are similarities. Um, the underlying, uh, the knowledge is the same across most programming languages. C++ is a bit more complicated with the memory management, um, but it was surprisingly easy. It, it's one of those things that uh, is quite daunting. Um, but then I think all three of the browsers really make it quite easy to get started to download the code and, and poke around with it. And then from there, you kind of pick things up following what's already there um so you don't necessarily actually need to have like brilliant c++ knowledge beforehand like the webkit team um and the the chromium team were brilliant in terms of helping out answering questions when i had them so i think uh one of the things that i see people want to get involved with standards is because of things like bugs and incompatibilities or like a feature that is like in two browsers isn't in the third one or something but also i think there's like people who think you know they have ideas about how to make something better and they want to either you know they want to know how to make that real i guess right i don't know does anybody have advice for people who have those kind of those kind of thoughts or, or like what, what are good reasons to get involved? What are good ways to get involved? Uh, who has some comments on that? So it, it's easy to have ideas, uh, right? Like I want to add a new element or a new API to do foobar. Um, and that's great. Uh, you you will do foobar probably. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but then how do you get it across the finish line and what, what is required? Uh, a few years ago when I worked at Buku, I, we created this guidebook, uh, called web platform contribution guide, which tries to answer some of these questions. So it's at wpc.guide. It's a free guidebook and it tries to give a high level overview of how standards are being worked on and what goes into changing them. So there's a section called how to fix a spec bug, um, which is sort of similar or the process rather is similar for how do I introduce a new feature for the web platform? So mm -hmm. if you go from an idea, uh, you then need to do some research to like, has this been discussed before? What are the use cases, what I'm actually trying to solve um, and try to convince the browser vendors or other parties that your, uh, the use case is important to solve and that your idea is a good way to solve it. Yeah. And my experience certainly is that use cases are kind of king these days, at least in the CSS working group, <clears throat> you can have a great idea, but if you have no use cases, it tends to it tends to be lower on the priority list. Whereas if you have right. a use case of, Hey, this feature would be great because we tried to do this and it, we couldn't do it, or we had to script our way around it. It's a, you know, those sorts of things. Um, those get higher priority for discussion. Yeah, exactly. I think another key thing with use cases as well is it helps to make sure that the API design you come up with is actually the best. Cause if you come up with solutions, then it might be perfect for what you're trying to do, but you might be able to do it in quite a different way that achieves 
even more and there's an even better design. Um, and we had this even at my previous role with the web application development is oftentimes we'd have people come up with solutions without giving us the use case. And that makes it quite hard for us to evaluate actually what it's trying to do. Whereas if they come to us and go, we want to do this, here's an idea we've got as to how to go about doing it. Then we can have a discussion about what's the best way of doing it. Um, and I think the same applies in, in web standards. Yeah, it does. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you file an issue and only present a solution without explaining what the problem is, then the first pushback you will get is, what's the use case? What are you trying to do? Uh, right. And if you're not, yeah. a, if you're not able to explain that, then it's like, yeah. uh, the issue will be closed probably. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. It, there's, there's definitely an attitude, uh, uh, an attitude there of, we need to know why, right? You can tell us yeah. what you want to do and how you want to do it, but we really need to understand why you want to do it. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's good design practice for any standard, right? You know, cause you can just, you can make up whatever, but if you haven't, been able to think through as a group why a thing needs to be done, then you're much more likely to to, to create something that's you know too limited or just not not uh, future robust. I think this is true in like all software development. You know um, that you know you need good use cases, and that you know the more you can kind of zoom out and look at it, like are you coming up with like too general, too specific a solution, like that frequently is only something that you know with like uh, a lot of eyeballs and probably even some experience. <laughs> and that is a problem because on the web platform, you don't really get that opportunity, right? Like we have to get it pretty good out of the gate because we're, we can probably improve it a little bit, but you know, once it's in, we can't then say, oh, well, that was a mistake. Let's try again. Um, yeah. Let's let's take it out. Like, you, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not that we totally can't. Occasionally, we have done things like that with, like, app cache or something. But, Fair. but yeah, it's it's much harder. And also, like, it, it's it's difficult to get people through the process because one thing that we haven't talked about really is that... There are too many, I mean, we talk about it on the show all the time, like there are too many asks of this platform that powers almost everything in the modern world at this point, and just not enough resources to do it all. And so, you know, like we can't afford a lot of misses because then <laughs> we lose the momentum toward getting it actually done in the first place. Um. There are some maybe other examples of that too, like the document outline. Yeah. Uh, so a bit of context. Uh, I guess if we go enough back in history, the XHTML2 spec back in the day had an H element for a heading and a section element for a section. So that, that was a really nice way to nest sections within sections and be able to compose your document into another document and not have to worry about the numbers in your heading tags. Proposed by Tim Berners-Lee in 1991. Yeah, 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 it even goes before XHTML2. But it, it didn't become a reality uh, in that way. And when HTML5 became the thing that was had momentum, Hixie made a proposal to use the H1 element as the H element, basically, and introduced section and uh, other sectioning elements. So the idea was then that you would use uh, H1 elements and have the heading level be computed based on what came earlier in the document. Well, and the reason just... for that, though, is because why, Simon? Why, like, why not just put an H element? Uh, because it would mean nothing in uh, older browsers. So it had a better, uh, worse backwards compatibility behavior. Like it's a, a new element is an unknown element for existing browsers. So the thought was that, oh, okay, if with an H1, 
users still perceive that it's a heading. It just has the wrong heading level. Uh, and that was more acceptable than not being able to navigate by headings at all. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, especially given that if you look at it, like most of the web doesn't have like really doesn't doesn't have good headings already right we just know that they are headings and there's like some kind yeah. of relative importance weight to them so the the big difference with the backward compatibility story is you know they, at least it's a heading and you can see all that you can get a list of all the headings and things yeah right but yeah the outline algorithm that was as it was referred to was I think too complicated and wasn't implemented in browsers for, even though it was in the spec for, I don't know, over a decade. And a few years ago, uh, I think Firefox tried to implement it, uh, but then the experience for AT or assistive technology users would regress with as heading elements are actually used on the web with the outline algorithm. I guess that we should say that there's two pieces to this, right? So one is like, what does this mean? What is the semantic meaning of this? But the other is, what does it look like, right? And yeah. the proposal allowed that basically the size, we all know, like if you put an H1 in a markdown document or whatever, just like simple bare HTML document, you put an H1, it's this ginormous, you know, Times Square kind of <laughs> letters. Um the algorithm uh, implemented that, you know, it would manage the size of those H1s for you. And that part was implemented by browsers, but only that part. Yes. Yeah. So that's just uh, a style rule in the user agent style sheet. So that was easy to implement. Uh, however, it doesn't affect what is exposed to screen reader users. So in a screen reader user, navigates to a heading, uh, the screen reader will announce, oh, this is a level one heading, or this is a level five heading. Uh, and that computation uh, based on the outline algorithm was never implemented. And it's kind so of worse, a, right? It's worse because it looks like it worked, you know? Yeah, visually uh, it, it had an effect, but the, the important, more important aspect was exposing it to uh, assistive technology correctly. When that didn't work, that's a, a bad situation. It feels like you could just sort of like track the level through the, the CSS that makes that work. And it should, should not be that hard to compute, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's been re that's been really difficult, and I think even recently you've been trying to get the um, the style sheet part removed because we finally it took many years to just admit that the document outline isn't a thing and take it out of the HTML specification. Right, and now you're trying to get it out of the UA sheets, right? Yeah, so I managed to remove the. Uh, H1 styling in H group uh, so that there was style rules that would make uh, or maybe it was H2 and, and other but it, there were H group styles that weren't implemented in browsers so that was just easy to rip out of the spec um, but the spec still has H1 in section uh, default styles uh, so the, the problem or the confusing behavior still exists, uh, even though we admit a defeat on the outline algorithm and the challenge is like, how do we remove the default user agent styles without breaking websites? Uh, any change to the user agent style sheets has a web compat risk to it. And so uh, I asked some Chromium developers to implement a use counter a couple of years ago uh, to figure out like when, how common is it for sites to depend on the default styles for such headings? Uh, obviously, if you have 
author level CSS that overrides the font size, then there's no problem. But some some sites uh, can leave the default styles as is and then have other styles surrounding it. Uh, so I'm, what I did recently was to write a patch for Firefox to remove the user agent styles uh, behind a pref. So it's only av av available in, or it's on by default in nightly, but not on release. Uh, so we we do that as an experiment to see how many bug reports do we get. Like we, we know it's potentially affects uh, a lot of websites based on the use counter in Chromium. Um, and uh, yeah, actually before I did the patch, I did a manual analysis of, I think it was 30 websites um, to see what, what is the actual visual change with the removed default style sheet. Uh, and mostly for those sites, uh, it, there was either no visual change or just minor fun, minor changes or just acceptable, uh, in my opinion, changes. But you can see yeah. like we're way down in, in the rabbit hole on this <laughs> and that is what standards are, right? I mean, right. Um, you should be prepared to go way, way down a lot of rabbit holes if you want to get involved with web standards, probably. Um, I'll just mention that that particular one uh, that we were just talking about on the very last episode, we were asked, like, if you could sort of like go back in time and change one thing, what would it be? And the, the, my answer was in 1991, I would have made section and hit NH work <laughs> <laughs> because just thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of, of people's time that could be spent doing something other than this, other than going down these rabbit holes for years and years and years. Simon, I would like to also mention really quickly that um, since we're talking about um, things that get sort of burnt into the platform and then we like can't really undo, there's no take backs, um, the HTML parser. Uh, Simon is mm -hmm. the author of a, a book about the HTML parser is really interesting. So it's a book that I started to write in, I think it was 2018. Uh, and then I haven't finished writing it, uh, but I still intend to do so. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. Uh, so the book is called idiosyncrasies of the HTML parser. Uh, it's a freely available as a web book. Uh, at htmlparser.info. You can also buy uh, an ebook variant if you prefer that. And yeah, I go over the history of what preceded the specified HTML parser, how did browsers work before then, and Ian Hickson's work with uh, figuring out what the behavior should be and specifying that, and go going over all of the different aspects of the HTML parser and what the result is for different kinds of input. Yeah, and a lot of the a lot of the rationale in the at the end of the day is like practical, right? Because it's like, well, yeah, you know, two of three browsers or four of five browsers did this, and so the web relies on that now, and we can't change it, even if we think it's not a great idea. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you uh, you you said you've you've had a couple of patches merged to the user styles. Which is very cool. Um, I'm feeling a little envious. I don't think I've ever had a patch merged to browser user style sheets. Maybe that's a thing I should start looking into. But um, yeah, what I'm curious about, uh, and Luke, I know that you've contributed many patches to browsers. Um, like, what is that like? <laughs> if 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 someone were interested in actually helping optimize, a, you know, something in a browser or submitting code patches, what, how does one get started and, and what should one expect? Yeah. So as someone who's done that, like started on that relatively recently, it was only about a year ago, I would say that I properly started contributing to browsers. I was surprised at how it was actually quite simple. Um, and I think 
part of that is that things have got much simpler over time. Like WebKit, for example, nowadays it is just a pull request on GitHub and you get your you get your change merged. Whereas I think back in the day it was in patches manually through their uh, bug interface. I, the first thing, I guess, is just kind of working out what it is you want to work on. If it's something small, then great. If it's something larger, trying to trying to think on how you can can split that up. So, as an example, I found that the spec for inverted colors and the implementation inside of WebKit, the um, the UA style sheet didn't match, which I found was quite odd because WebKit was the only one who actually implements that that media query. And I think what's happened is that WebKit's implemented this a while back. It's been added to the spec, and then the spec's been updated years later, and it's just not fed back in. Um, so that's a relatively easy change. You're finding the bit in the WebKit code base where the problem is, make the change. And it's fairly self-explanatory for reviewers. You, you just point them to the bit in the spec and go, look, here's what the spec says. Here's what your code says. Here's the difference. Um, and then oftentimes you'll be told, kind of how to go about testing it. Um, some things are quite easy to test. Uh, a lot of the time, if you're implementing something that's already implemented in other browsers, there's already quite good test coverage for you. Um, other times you have to write it yourself. I think web platform tests especially are very well documented. There's quite a good website that explains how to go about doing certain things. And then I think the other part is the web platform is massive. It's it's unlikely that what you're doing is so new that there's not an example of it already done. Um, so mm-hmm. that's that's another great example. If if you want to look at how to, for example, the scroll bar styling, I was like, oh, I wonder how to parse the CSS for this. And then, well, you just go and have a look at the CSS parser in WebKit, and you'll probably find something that's the same or, or very similar. Um, and you can kind of copy that um especially because you just play around with these things locally you can just like git clone the repository webkit and firefox build relatively quickly at least on on mac os chrome uh is a bit slower how how fast or slower are we talking about here so chrome is in the region of hours webkit <laughs> is on my like i had a, a mac mini which is still quite a quite a high end machine but that did it in about 40 minutes for the for the clean build and then for the iterative build it's much faster and then firefox weirdly is quite a bit faster than even that but still like to to build an engine you're looking at it probably half an hour or so yeah. just to just to do a build unless it's chrome in which case you run it overnight um that that seems like a challenge i'm i'm so used to like the kinds of the kinds of updates that I do are on web pages and I save it and I tab and I reload and the changes there and either I broke it or I didn't. So that is a, that is a big difference. Yeah. You, you can build Chromium to help supplement your heating. That, <laughs> it, it very much is kind of like that. Like on my old, on my old machine, it was, I run it building overnight, wake up in the morning and hope that Chrome is launched. And I don't get a little sad red error box that says you've made a typo here. Right. I wanted to really quickly mention that I do these blog posts a couple times a year, maybe that look at our Egalius commits to a lot of significant open source projects. And I published my last one. It was called mid season power rankings for 2023. It was in, maybe July or August last year. And I just wanted to say that I remember distinctly that Luke all by himself was showing up in there in like the top 10 or 15 uh, contributors to both Chromium and WebKit. And I was like, wow, that's, that's a lot of commits. (laughs) So uh, good work. I guess you got kind of into it. Yeah, I, I spotted that at the time. I thought there, there must be a mistake here because it just didn't kind of, I, I guess it didn't make sense because I had, I've done a fair amount, but I wouldn't say I've done loads. Yeah, in fairness, generally speaking, I think it, it falls off fast. So you have like a, you know, a, like let's say Apple, for example, they contribute like 75, 80% of all of the work for WebKit is done by Apple, something like that. And then Agalia, 
is number two and we do, you know, 15% and then like maybe the next percent is 5% and the next percent is 2%, right? And when you yeah. get individual committers, like there's not that many companies that are involved in, and we're counting, you know, groups. And when you get to individual committers, I don't think it, it does take that much to show up in, in that list. Um, but it, t- it does take a pretty significant, I mean, I imagine that was yeah. like a considerable amount of your time and effort that you were, that you were doing there to show up. So still nice work. Yeah. Yeah. That, it was, it really was just like finding things that I wanted to fix. So I, I spent a, uh, quite a bit of time last last summer um looking at the media queries specifically the user preference ones um because and and this this is something that i'll come on to in a bit but i've always found stuff like dark mode like really nice but i've always found that they're harder to utilize than they kind of could be and as part of that i realized that linux for example has a high contrast setting and Chrome just wasn't reflecting that in the preference media queries, even though all of the wiring was there. It was just not piped through for whatever reason. Um, so that was one of the fixes. And then there was a fix for there isn't a contrast setting on Android, but there is a high contrast text setting. So we ended up using that and wiring that through um, just doing these like minor well, for to me, minor fixes, but I'm sure to the people who rely on those those kind of preferences, it's probably probably quite nice changes. And that's actually some of the changes I've done to Firefox has been doing doing similar things, because the Android platform for both Chrome and Firefox is quite a lot of Java rather than um, C++, which makes sense because Android development is Java, um, and that's uh, that's how I learned to code. So I'm quite quite comfortable in Java. So one of the other things in terms of the getting into standards that I've, that I've worked on the first, I guess the second standard that I've uh, that I've come up with proposal wise is the the web preferences API, and that's currently in the uh, web platform incubator group. I think it's called. This actually brings up something that's kind of important, which is there are a lot of organizations or a lot of. Um, a lot of standards bodies, a lot of committees, a lot of interest groups, a lot of community groups, that sort of thing. What, what would you, you know, any of us really, what would we recommend to somebody who's thinking of getting started and then looks at the landscape and says, wait, wh- where do I even go? Like, how do I figure out who I should talk to about this? Yeah, I, I would say as a newcomer, that's probably one of the most daunting parts, especially because... From an outside perspective, at least in in my case, there's this idea that the W3C is kind of pay to play. And I know that's not necessarily true, but there's that perception. Um, But then obviously all of the community groups are W3C, but anyone can come along and join them. So it's it's hard from that front, but I guess it's just a thing. Like I've always been interested in in styling of uh, form UI. Um, again, I've worked on web applications for five years. It's something we've all built a multi-select input and tried to make it decent. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then I heard, oh, they're trying to do that, actually fix it at the web platform level. And I think this is probably a presentation that Greg Whitworth made, who at the time was at Microsoft Edge. And I think this was probably all, all the way back when they were picking up Chromium as their engine. So they were putting a lot of work into the form controls. And then that kind of got me interested in following along what OpenUI were doing. So that's that's something I I spent quite a bit of my time doing was the OpenUI community group. But then, yeah, so if you want to if you want to contribute to HTML, then it's WhatWG, which don't have the membership requirements in the same way that the W3C do. Um, So it's certainly it's certainly an interesting landscape. I think the key takeaway is it's not as hard to get involved as it might seem open an issue somewhere with your idea and if it's the wrong place they'll tell you where to go usually politely (laughs) yeah yeah they'll they'll tell you they'll try to be helpful because tell you where to go could be (laughs) understood two different ways yeah yeah general generally speaking i mean of course it everything depends on how you come in and you know there are 
always the stories of someone who comes in and basically opens an issue that says, you're all wrong and you're all stupid and this is how you should do it. And that doesn't usually get anywhere. Um, and maybe even at that, I think people still try to be helpful in the sense of, well, really, you, you want to be over here. Although <laughs> I guess yeah. if someone's abrasive enough, they don't do that because they don't want to subject another group to the same thing they just they just got subjected to. But, you know, if you come in and say, hey, this is a this is a thing that I've identified that would be good, you know, and here's why. And, you know, you appear to be trying to make the case and, and do it right. They, you know, you might get a, you know, I see what you're saying, but you actually want to be in the CSS working group or at the, you know, the WICG. So Simon, what are, what are your thoughts about all of this sort of thing? Yeah. So I think it's, uh, even for someone who has been doing this for a long time, knowing where to go to file an issue is not always obvious. Uh, and there are a lot of, uh, there are several standards organizations. We've mentioned W3C, WebWig. There's also IETF for some like network stuff like TCP, HTTP, and then Kronos for WebGL, uh, probably forgetting some that are relevant for web standards. And even and then within each org, they have a different patent policy uh, or membership agreement or what you want to call it and different kinds of groups. I think W3C has probably the most different kinds of groups uh, and different group or a number of groups overall. But I think as a newcomer, if you want to figure out where to go with your idea, uh, my advice would be to find a nearby or adjacent existing feature and look it up on MDN. And that will point you to the right spec for that thing. And then that spec has uh, at the top, uh, maybe it has a status of this document or so where it says which group is uh, maintaining that spec or where to file issues. Uh, so that's my general approach to uh, figuring out how, how to or where to file issues. Like, find a similar thing and then see which which spec covers the thing that I want or something similar to what I want. And frequently it's not even just one in the end, right? Right. Frequently you, you have to touch multiple things because there's a little bit over here in CSS and this spec and there's a little bit over here in HTML and maybe there's... Yeah, that make, in... makes it even more interesting to contribute also because you get uh, cross dependencies and things don't build uh, because uh, your patch will depend on your other patch and the the terms don't exist. Uh, so that's also interesting. Uh, like if you need to update uh, the fetch spec and the HTML spec and uh, some other spec. Yeah, I think there are also lots of like degrees in which people get involved. Like there are people who ultimately end up doing some of this, you know, for a living, um, dedicating all of their time to it. And then there are people who uh, are invited experts, for example, in W3C, who maybe like they're not doing spec work or implementation work, but they're, you know, dedicating their life to this field maybe. And, you know, they come to meetings for, for those purposes. So, uh, you know, it's maybe a, a chunk of their, their actual time. And then there's people who, you know, get involved in, they just, they want to be involved in discussion. They want to make suggestions. They want to critique suggestions. <laughs> they, um, I don't know all, all different. There's yeah. all different kinds of ways and, and reasons that you can be involved. Uh, another one that we didn't talk about, I think that is useful is to circle us back all the way to where we began is testing. Um, there's the web platform tests project, which, um, I think is like one of the more important things that we have. And it's also 
I mean, it is a little bit intimidating. I'm not going to lie. Um, if you've never contributed to it, but, um, but it's not hard to, uh, get it running, to check it out and to start writing some tests. And I think developers write tests and share them all the time. They're just not web platform tests. So, um, yeah, a lot of them show up in code pen and yeah. JS fiddle and that sort of thing where somebody just puts up a, Hey, I'm trying to do this thing and here's what I discovered. Or, do you know, Microsoft made an interface for that. Uh, I think uh, Francois Remy, who's on the CSS working group and worked at Microsoft while he was there, he made a like a web a thing where you could like do that through a website. I don't know if that's still running, um, but it was it was pretty neat. Um, yeah, I we should have that. something like that. Somebody should fund it <laughs> if it's not already <laughs> there, because. Mm. I do think that web developers, you know, like can contribute in that way. It's a, it's a low friction. You don't have to boil the whole ocean. You don't have to commit, you know, gobs and gobs and gobs of time to say, gee, this doesn't work this way. Shouldn't it work this way according to the spec? And if so, then I would like to contribute that as a test, you know? Well, I think this, that, that circles back to what I said in the beginning, which is, when I got started, it was writing JS Fiddle, minor, like minimal reproductions and making uh, browser bug reports with them. Um, Cause that's, that's the language I knew. It was JavaScript and it was uh, HTML and it was CSS. Um, and that is just what web platform tests are. There's some helper functions, but at the end of the day, it is just HTML, JavaScript and CSS. Um, so it's a good way to get started, but to e even bring it back a, a higher level than that, just raising browser bugs is a big start. I know lots of people, they're quite busy in their day job. They don't necessarily have time to make minimal reproductions. But just doing that is is a brilliant start. Um, and that's also how quite a lot of spec discussion earlier on um, that I've started out on actually ended up happening. Is I went and raised some browser bugs and maybe it didn't behave the same across all three browsers. I couldn't work out which one was correct. So I just go and create a bug in all three and go, here's each other's bugs, go and work out who's correct sort of thing. And normally if it's an interrupt bug, it will end up going back to the, the standards body. Um, and then that's recently actually led to um, the change in the spec and the implementation. Because that's another thing. If you don't know where to where to go necessarily, they'll, they'll know which standards body to go to. And then you can kind of follow the discussion along there. Um, which is exactly what I did with the outline color one. Yeah, and then changes do end up happening. I mean, that's a really simple sounding thing. But to be honest, do you think that most developers know where to report bugs? Simon, it, I think this is in the WC, WPC dot guide, right? Yes, it's covered in the uh, guide for how to fix uh, W3C or what wig bug. Uh, the, the last step is report bugs for browser engines and the test links for Gecko and WebKits and Chromium uh, and some high level advice. Awesome. So definitely check out WPC guide because it will have lots of handy dandy pointers to things. If you have questions after the show. Yeah, it's interesting. I, i never knew this existed. Um, and having read through it, there's lots of lots of things on here that are very useful. An interesting thing that you can do, for example, to get involved is one of the ways that I know Luke from, as he mentioned, is OpenUI. Uh, OpenUI is uh, trying to do a lot of things. And if you have the time, you can go to meetings. You don't have to go to all the meetings, but uh, they're... Uh, Thursdays, um, you look up open UI on X or on Mastodon and, uh, you can go to meetings and, and see what they're like and what they're very open to developers showing up, but there will be implementers there. There will be people from multiple engines and you can kind of get a, get a taste for that. You don't have to actively comment or you can, if you want to. Uh, and you'll you'll see what what being in one of those is like. I think that's a a nice sort of 
introduction if you want to check that out. Good things are happening there. I think it's a really good way to see what it's like if you haven't. So that's my suggestion. And GitHub, I think, is great. So you can go to github.com slash whatwg, w3c, and just poke around and explore and see what see what's interesting to you. For me, I think uh, the great thing with community groups is if, if there's a topic you're interested in, there will be a community group for it. And if there isn't, you can set one up. They are very approachable to anyone to join. Um, like to, to open your life, for example, we actively want web developers to come along to because they're the ones providing us information on what exactly we need to be focusing on. Because like you say, there's there's so many things we want to work on and, and not necessarily that much time to be able to focus on them. Um, and we might think that things are important and they probably are, but maybe they're not as important as certain other things that the developers might want. I will add also that if listeners think that attending meetings feels in, too intimidating, uh, there are also chat rooms that are where a lot of discussion happens, uh, different Standards groups have a, a room on Matrix or IRC that you can join. Anyone can join and ask questions or just lurk. That's also a, a way to participate in text. Yeah, and following uh, GitHub uh, repos is a, a similar way that you can do that that sort of seems to have yeah. replaced the mailing list route that I think Eric and Simon and I probably all took where we would you would follow a mailing list and and lurk for a long time before you got involved maybe yeah yeah it's interesting how we collectively all used mailing lists for all of the technical discussion and then mm -hmm. at some point moved to github issues yeah or the, the i guess there was a bugzilla step in between also we used w3c <laughs> bugzilla <laughs> for a while yeah what were you saying luke I, I think a big part of that's the discoverability. GitHub issues that they're, they're indexable. Like Google, Google will surface them. So if you're, I don't know, one example, like Open UI wasn't actually the first community group I joined. There was the web extensions one that I joined um, because I, for a while, have done lots of my implementation work on the web applications was credential related, um, implementing stuff like pass keys. And I just kept hitting the same thought that we should be handling these better in the browser. Um, it's brilliant the browsers have built-in password managers, but realistically, no one uses them. We all use third-party ones, um, and they just don't have the integration with the with the browsers that they should do, in my opinion. Um, so I had that as a thought, and I went along to the web extension community group. But now if you go and search for something like um, credential manager web extension API, the issue will probably show up. Um, so it's a good way to find kind of if you're if you're interested in ideas, being able to just search GitHub for for previous discussions. It's quite yeah. Useful. The mailing lists that we were talking about were public and the rooms are public as well. And they both matrix and IRC can be like, they can have like long logs, like permanent logs. Mm. So yeah. um, you don't discover them too much anymore via search, but they used to be like, they would show up in search. Uh, you would find it if you went and looked at some of these really old topics where all the discussion was on mailing lists instead of GitHub, you would still find them. Um, I think the, the bigger problem there, like how long will those actually live? So some of them have disappeared uh, because it's, you know, maintained by whatever, some, even some college that was maintaining them that, well, the, the college doesn't exist anymore. That, that happens, believe it or not. So, uh -huh. um, so a bunch of the early things from the web have been kind of mirrored in other places, archived somewhere, but, um, yeah, but it, it all, it all was indexed and it all is searchable in theory, as long as those things remain, but some of them are a little bit hard to find. Uh, these days and w3c actually had a has a pretty nice uh, mechanism for searching the mailing list and stuff so 
is there anything that you want to say in in closing that we you think we should have covered that maybe we didn't or I can add that the knowing that discussion happened on IRC or mailing lists or W3C Bugzilla is useful for spec archaeology, as I call it, uh, like finding all of the prior discussion for a particular issue. Definitely. If you only look at GitHub for finding all of the prior discussions, you will uh, miss the era that came before GitHub. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to find all of the prior discussions, you need to look at the mailing lists and the other places as well. A thing that I found that is interesting and also maybe frustrating is that sometimes that archaeology that you do, like you can find, uh, well, you know, we abandoned this idea or we, we changed this. We did something a different way because of this rationale. And if you wait long enough, somebody might change their mind about whether that rationale is good or bad and then yeah. like change all of the outcomes and discussions that come after that were based on that. Right. So almost nothing is written in stone forever as like a infallible <laughs> principle that we can't change. So, yeah, absolutely. I think a, a good thing with that, is, again, is if you come with your use cases, even if someone's previously proposed exactly what you're proposing, it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't mean it's just going to get thrown out because as you say, the, the rationale and the reasoning does change. Yeah. Um, it may have been previously performance wise, we couldn't do it, but nowadays you've got container queries and now that means that suddenly all these things are actually capable. Yeah. Um, as other, I guess there's like one last thing that I would like to add if we can, which is like, what should people expect? You know, um, I know that some people are like, well, if I could just get in the room, you know, if I, if I could just. If I could just show people this proposal, that would, you know, this would happen and maybe, maybe even a expectation about how quickly it can happen or anything. So, yeah, I would say first, there's probably relatively low like likelihood that whatever solution you had in mind uh, is going to end up in browsers in the short term. Like the, as we said earlier, that there are a lot of ideas uh, and it's, so many people working on the web platform and on specs. So not everything uh, gets properly considered, unfortunately. And then the timeline, it, it takes time to get uh, things first to get consensus between all of the browser vendors uh, on how exactly something should work. And then when, when it gets prioritized for implementation, the timeline can be years in some cases. Uh, obviously, if you step up to work on the implementation yourself, you can speed it up. Yeah, I think even implementers bring proposals. So Google, especially, like they they throw a lot of stuff at the wall, and a whole bunch of it doesn't stick, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not like anybody, even you know, companies with uh, people who are, have a lot of expertise in this area a lot of credibility, the promise of we will implement this, or maybe we even have implemented it as a prototype or something, can make something happen really quickly or even at all. And so, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you have to follow the same rules and probably you don't have those other advantages as well. <laughs> so to keep your expectations like realistic, understand those things and um be patient be kind and yeah yeah that's not to say to expect failure though i think that's one thing to make clear is don't expect sure. guaranteed success but but things do happen absolutely yeah like it can look like things are moving slowly and then suddenly kind of everything happens overnight yeah definitely eric anything from you as a last parting Listen to these people. They know of what they speak. Okay. Thanks for uh, coming on as guests, guys. It was, uh, it was a fun talk. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us.